I'm ready to go, yeah. And Ladies and gentlemen, I hail from a very small village that's north of Los Angeles. My town is called San Francisco. We have awesome bridges there. Another thing we have is a lot of investment and exit and entrepreneurship. And the hottest topic of the day in San Francisco is growth hacking, which is more or less the practice of bringing your effective cost per user acquisition down dramatically by diverting activity from low yield areas of pursuit to activity of high yield areas of pursuit. And to give you an example, we all know that the cost per acquisition on mobile users is quite obscene. Last year, uh, my co-founders and I were working on a game called Puppet Face that was a dancing game. Uh, we added the Gun Gun style dance and Gun Gun style to the name of the game. And can you guess what happened, Nick? I can't tell everyone. 500,000 downloads, bam. Nick here is also from the small hamlet of San Francisco from a small company called Facebook. He is a data scientist and we're all very eager to hear what he has to say. Nick? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, my name is Nick and I'm a data scientist. I'm gonna talk about growth hacking. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is growth hacking? If you trace the term back, it was first used by a serial entrepreneur in uh, 2010. A, a growth hacker is a person whose true north is growth. What the hell does that mean? I, I, I try to look at it, it doesn't mean anything to me. So I search the web and then you hear things like non-traditional ways, more focused on this, typically innovative and it's out of the box. Well, I read all these things and I'm gonna put them all to one side. What I'm gonna tell you is my opinion about what growth hacking is. I'm gonna give you some advice. So first of all, there is no such thing as a silver bullet in growth hacking. Anybody who comes up to you and just says, oh, we'll just push the growth hacking button has got it all wrong. And as growth hackers go, there's no such thing as silver cannonballs either, which is what growth hackers really want. There's no secret toolbox. The secret is in the mindset, not the tool set. Tools are very important, we're gonna talk about tools later, but the secret is in the mindset. You need to think like a growth hacker. So what's the difference between growth hacking and traditional marketing? Well, traditional marketing is used in established businesses and they're happy with, you know, five to 10% growth. If you're any startups or indies here, you're kind of looking at 10,000% growth. You can't take the budget of a uh, established set of company and grow it a thousand times and expect to do the same thing or do the other thing around. You, you're just not gonna be able to do it. So with growth hacking, you need something that's going to scale incredibly well. And again, differences between growth hacking and marketing. Marketing is used, it's established in longer frequency. And you know, anybody here who's an indie have an established brand or install base they can leverage? Well, probably not. How many has an incredible, people here have incredibly large budgets? No. Do you have a well-tested product? Uh, no. Marketing budgets are planned in advance, and you know, they tend to make people lazy. But another way of kind of sort of saying all these things was uh, summed up by a, a good growth hacker, Sir Winston Churchill. It's like, gentlemen, we've run out of money, now we have to think. If you had no money and you had to promote your product, what are you gonna do? So now onto the main part of the presentation. This is your game. If a tree falls down a forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Forget the words also there, but if you have the greatest game in the world, and nobody knows about it. It's just the greatest game in the world that nobody knows about. And so content is king. Yeah, you need a great game, but oh my God, distribution is God. Awareness for your game is just like the single most important thing. And I don't know how many times I can say this. Visibility is oxygen. You are gonna starve without it. Some quotes, and we're gonna have lots of quotes sort of go through today's presentations. We were kind of naive. We thought if we made a really good product, it would just sell, but that's just not the case. You need more than just a good product. Why is that important? Type something in, uh, best social game. And I tried this out just before I came. This is the results I got. And kind of the problem is, who the hell clicks over there? If you're not in that one through 10, you're not gonna get the results. And it's been awful lot better being through 11 through 20 and 21 through 30. You kind of need to be at this end of this, the scale in order to get visibility. You've heard people talk about it. Probably, we could argue about what the sort of cost happens to be, a dollar eight, whatever it to be, but user acquisition costs are probably your single biggest expense. And with sort of growth hacking, history is kind of written by the victors. Um, so you don't hear about all the failures that have come out. You only hear about the people that succeeded. But again, because it's a growth hacking the mindset, you can't just follow what someone else has done. You have to follow their ideas, but the concepts, not their ideas. I mean, uh, if they, I could have done Flappy Birds when I did this. But at the end of the day, if somebody sort of told you that the way to promote your product is to do this dress in a costume and dress like a fox, you know what? 
No, it does great things, but it's the concept about they hack this idea. Anyone played sort of Dumb Ways today? Oh, we all sort of know the song. It's a great value idea. They managed to parlay it into a top 20 app just by people wanting to share it because it's kind of fun. And, and Yussi sort of uh, talked about it already, to share it. You want to do something that people want to share, not because they're told to share. It's an emotional involvement. They kind of want to go ahead and sort of share it. Okay, so all that out of the way, at the end of the day, it's the product. You have a good restaurant because you serve great food. Not because you tell people you serve great food. You know, if you say, well, come to my restaurant, I have great food. If you have garbage food, you're not going to last very long. And you can do growth hacking with a, with a, with a bad product. But at the end of the day, you just damage the market for everybody. It's what, uh, apologies for any who's a used car salesman here. But if you sell a used car, you're more interested in selling that car and then being done with the day. You're never going to get that repeat business. At the end of the day, everybody has a bad taste in their mouth at the end of that transaction. So first piece of advice for you, serve great food. Please make great games. Making great games is what's going to sort of help them keep the market going. Build a great product. I'm not going to get into the, in, in the mathematics of all this, but everyone talks about the virality, the K factor. I like the more of the, uh, the, the nuclear version of it. That's sort of uh, a neutron smashing into a sort of some uh, uranium. You tell one person about it, they tell two people, two people tell four people, four people tell other people, and it sort of goes on from there. This is really important. Why? It gets your users to be your ambassadors. You don't have to tell people yourself. Imagine if you had to call up every single one of your customers saying, hey, this is a really great game. No, you tell somebody and they tell other people. It scales easily. And here's a key part as well. It leverages other existing communication networks. It uses their resources, not yours. Use Facebook's resources to get everyone to tell about your product, or Twitter's, or something else. Don't have to call them up yourself. A-B testing. Anyone in this room not doing A-B testing? Go directly to jail. If you're not testing, A-B testing your product, you shouldn't be here. This is the most important thing. Analytics driving that sort of tight viral loop. A little bit of A-B testing humor here. Next most important thing, it's the taste of the fish, not the taste of the fisherman. Don't be a prima donna. If your designer says, oh no, this button needs to be red because it's the just the position of this, or that, no, don't listen to them. Test it out. And we have a saying where I work, data levels all arguments. People can argue about it and pontificate whatever sort of goes on. Do your A-B test. Try this with this, this with this. The rich get richer, the other ideas sort of don't. So again, data levels all arguments. That's important. Iteration is also the name of the game. It goes back to A-B testing. What happens? You try something. You learn from the results and the mistakes. You can learn just as much from an uh, experiment that doesn't go right. And then you iterate. Key to all this, you have to measure everything. If you don't, how do you know whether you're getting better or worse? And but Mr. Thor, another little quote here. There's no such thing as a failed experiment. Only experiments with unexpected outcomes. If you try something, you get the wrong price. You've realized this is not the right price to put this at. You don't measure everything, you can't see you improve. But, interesting quote about stats. It's, it's kind of a bit of a, a, a diss, but he uses statistics like a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. What does that mean? Well, if I sort of said, hey, if I lower the price of this product, I'm going to sell more, and you lower the price and you sell more, what have you learned? You've just supported your idea. Use it for illumination. How much do I lower the price of this? Do I get more sales? What's the Shadow Valley, how much do I lower it? I'm in order to get that particular price to work all the way around the curve to get the, the most maximum amount of money. Learn things. Guessing. Be data driven. Not sure. Testing always beats guessing. You know, I think this, I think this. Don't think, don't guess, try it out. Some sort of other quotes, you know, Sherlock Holmes, I never guess. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. One begins to twist the facts to suit theories instead of the theories to suit facts. Try it out. And I keep going with it. A, B, T. Always be testing. Try and measure everything, but if you can't, measure as much as you can. Errors using inadequate data are much less than using no data at all. The father of the computer said that, Charles Babbage. OK, now getting more sort of game specific. How much water is in the bath? There's a fascination in our industry with measuring DAUs, the measure of success for your game. Uh, DAUs, MAUs, daily active users. If you have a bathtub, daily active users, this is the number of people who's, who are actually playing your game. And one of two things can happen. You, know, you lose people and your daily active users goes down, or you gain people and your daily active users comes up. Down it goes, you're losing users, and you add more users at the top. What problem are you trying to solve? Imagine an experiment. I've got game A it has a million DAUs today, and it has a million DAUs tomorrow. Game B, a million DAUs today, a million DAUs tomorrow. Game A is a fantastically sticky game. It's amazing. All the million users who are playing the game 
playing the same game again tomorrow. It's just your unit acquisition team sucks, but the game is actually amazingly compelling. The game over here, the game sucks, but user acquisition team is knocking out of the park. They're living a fresh million eyeballs through every single day. They've both got DAUs of the same, but they're two very different problems to solve. And by fast focusing just on daily active users, you're just missing the entire thing. So again, next piece of advice, this particular acronym. Acquisition, engagement, retention, monetization. Leave here and go and build dashboards for these right away if you don't have them. The price of light is less than the cost of darkness. Even if it costs you money, go ahead and do these things. Where are your customers coming from? How much does it cost you to have them? And we'll go through them very quickly. Acquisition, this is like your first date. It's easy to get first dates. You may have to sort of pay money, but you get those sort of first dates comes on. If you're in the acquisition business, you're in the eyeball delivery business. If I was to pull in my pocket and get a USB drive and said, hey, there's a million names on here, how much would you pay for those names? Do you know what it's worth? Do you know what the lifetime value of those people are? Which are where the best users are coming from? You need to understand where your users are coming from. That's the first date. That's the acquisition. Then it's the engagement date. It's getting that second date, that third date, and that fourth date. A very sad statistic. Only 16% of apps get a third date. You've spent all that money with that customer acquisition cost getting things through. They try the out once, they try the second. What, six, oh, what, what, one in six people never get the third date. You need to very quickly get your users to that aha moment so they get the game, whether it's uh, a new user tutorial, where it's a very simple to understand mechanic. You have to get people there, otherwise you're going to be one of these people who's in the 16% bucket. Uh, just before I got here, I learned about this. Sort of, uh, anyone use Spotify, the long tail of content? Did you know that over 20% of songs on Spotify have never even been played once? Not even once! You can guess how many have just been played once or twice. It's that sort of long tail of all the sort of content. It's kind of really important to get that second date, that third date. Once you've got that past that engagement, it's all about retention. You need to hold on to those people. You've got a relationship with them. Buckets with holes, probably fixing more than they need more water. You spend a lot of money pouring people into the top here. $1.80 multiplied by six, because you know, they'll get there. You know, fix your basic core mechanic first, because if you spend all this money on user acquisition, they're going to come there, you're just going to lose them out of the bucket. That's, that's, a, that's a crazy thing to do. So, if you are going to do things in you, you know, the middle of a bold prototype, at least get the basic core mechanic all the way through. So this vertical slice of the game that they can play. Then if you want to expand it out horizontally and add more content to go this way, but get the basic beginning soup to nuts, cradle to grave sort of part of the game going first. Finally, you've got the retention. Now it's about monetizing. This is where the, 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 the payoff comes. It's lifetime value that's more important. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Again, you're not a used car salespeople. You want to build a relationship with somebody. Take care here. Uh, there's a lot of advice going around. Oh, you know, use your customers as prototypes and sort of uh, it fast iterate around them. Your most valuable users can be early adopters. They're those people, they're the squirrels, the pack rats. They, they, they look at all the review boards and they find out what the games are. They're the, probably the most vocal people. So if you give a bad experience for them, uh, when they thought, oh, Nick, I play a new game. I played Farmball. I don't want to play more. What's the next game I should play? Well, don't do that. It's not ready yet. And you've lost that sort of person. You don't get a second chance to make your first impression. So I know it's a software as a service, but you really, when you get your game ready out there, really make sure it's a great experience because you don't want to be in that sort of one in six sort of people who never come back again. People have sort of talked about it before, but you know, here's the basic equation for making money. You need to make more money in the lifetime than it costs you to get the user in there. If it's the wrong side of the line, you're not going to make any money. 93% of revenue, games revenue now, is freemium. What this means is, it's different from the old deluxe download business. Once upon a time, you get the money in advance, you get, you've convinced them to spend money, and then you kind of never hear from them again. Now, all your money is coming from this freemium model, or a massive chunk of it. So you need an ongoing relationship with your customers. It's not about just selling them something. It's, again, it's not used car salespeople. You need to get them and nurture that experience. Resurrection, a slight, slightly disturbing picture, I'm afraid. It's cheaper to bring somebody back from the dead than to find somebody new. You spend all that money getting all these new customers, and then for some reason they've kind of gone away. Bring them back. Nordius uh, recently spent uh, $3,500 on a re-engagement campaign on Facebook. This was actually on Canvas. Any ideas how much they got in immediate revenue back? $121,000. That sounds like a sort of pretty good return on investment to me. So if you've already got an audience, maybe you lost them. Invite them back into the fold. Keep at it. Everything compounds. A little bit of math for you. A 1% improvement over 365 days. After a year, you've got a 37-fold increase. 1% decrease compared after 365 days. You've only got 2.6% you know, of your users by the end of the day. 
the glass half full, glass half empty. Just, so, just that little improvement every day makes huge differences. Growth hacking isn't new. Any remember these things out of uh, telephone directories? Any ideas why a com custom company would call themselves AAA Plumbing? Because they're at the top of the list. And if you look through the directories, you'll find the Heathrow Hilton Hotel, Hilton Heathrow, London Heathrow Hilton, canonical forms. Again, they're doing all these sort of growth hacking sort of ideas for how to get their name uh, in there. Little Green Patch, one of the top games on Facebook uh, in the early days. Curly bra uh, round braces. They still search alphabetically right at the top of the list. So they were always top of the list. And you know, they did very well because of that. Do all you can to control you, to make your future better. Seize the day. Uh, what does this mean? Well, there's a lot of science instead of growth hacking. But when fortune shines, there's a lot of luck. When fortune shines on you, you have to be ready to exploit straight away. There is this fire hose of media content sort of going through. And just as I was preparing this presentation, you know, I looked at my sort of Twitter feed, and there it goes, showing all the things. It's just constantly flowing, this fire hose sort of going through. You have seconds to get noticed. Uh, and then you know, the most important thing is retreats, or create a bit of friction. So create good headlines. You know, if you're reading a newspaper, what are the headlines that causes you, thinks, makes you pause and read the, uh, read the rest of the copy? You know, people call it link bait. And again, if you do link bait and you do all these questions, and then you send them off to selling double glazing, well, you failed, and it's a bad experience, and sort of gone through. But with a creative piece of sort of headline, you know, the secret to how to avoid the biggest mistake, you kind of want to click on it. Even if you think it may not be you know, great, you kind of don't want to be in the dark, because you know everyone else is going to be clicking on it. You want to know, find out what other people are missing out from. Are you one of the 50% of people who are, uh, let us know things? Whatever gets people to click, think about creating good, a good growth hacker th thinks about all of these things. Anyone remember this? Chilean miner. He's wearing Oakley sunglasses. Some creative guy shipped a crate load, I think it was four dozen sets of uh, sunglasses off to the, the miners when they dug out. It's estimated a billion viewers around the world watched this rescue live. Turn that up, $41 million of free air time. Anybody here want $40 million of free advertising? There's a narrow window when these opportunities sort of come along. OK, you don't want to pray for a disaster. But maybe there's a, you have a game about a Peruvian tree frog. I don't know what sort of happens. And then there's a TV show on Friday night on the Discovery Channel about a Peruvian tree frog. And it gets sort of talked about or broadcast on the headlines. If you're going to be there with posts, oh, yeah, if you're interested, in, uh, here's our little game where we've got a rainforest simulation that sort of goes through. If this happens on a Friday night and you're there and you can jump on it, you're going to get a huge amount of traffic from it. If you wait until Monday morning, then it's a cat stuck up a tree, or it's the next news story that's just sort of flown up the top. You have to be ready for it. And these things sort of happen at 5 o'clock on a Friday or on a Saturday morning. You have to have your community ready. You have to be able to have your, uh, your company ready to uh, react on these things. Seize every opportunity, and it can happen any time. You've got to be ready for it. Kind of another example. Uh, Paris Hilton got banned from a hotel. I have no sort of idea why. But some other creative hotel chain sort of said, you know, hmm, how can we leverage this? Well, Paris Hilton's also banned from our hotel. We don't want to hear. And by the way, we have all these hotels. We have this, we have this, we have this. And you ride on the coattails of what those stories are. And that's kind of what a growth hacker does. He sort of thinks, how can I exploit this sort of particular situation? I don't actually have slides for it, but we're a bit ahead of time. Kind of another example. Um, there was an email marketing company once. And they were a small little company. And they were going, doing their business. And then their main competitor was going to get bought up. I think it was Cisco. I haven't got the slides for it. And Cisco was going to buy the company. Oh, this is going to be the kiss of death. Cisco, they bought our main competitor. We're just going to die. Well, hang on a minute, how can we turn this into a positive spin? The fact that Cisco has monitored the email marketing business shows how really important email marketing is. And this is what we do. This is what sort of goes on. The Google spiders go along, pick up that story, and they get the top headline. So when you search for this particular story, you picked up their competitors, and their productivity went through the roof. I don't know if you've heard about you know, uh, this particular guy. He, he crashed the, uh, the party. Oh, I just want to listen to the music. Everybody talked about this sort of headline. All he had to do was show up to a party that he wasn't invited to, and he got to the top headline. I don't have sort of time to sort of go in here, but there's any growth hackers here in the audience. There's a whole mix of ingredients you're going to be using. You're going to be blogging, uh, webcasting, uh, Facebook, radio, TV. You need to have some combination. All of these things are sort of tools that you could be using to sort of help promote your business. Facebook. OK, it wouldn't be here without me doing a bit of a, a, a Facebook pitch. If Facebook integration isn't part of your strategy, you're crazy. It's so crazy, I use Comic Sans for the font here, because you're, you're going to be absolutely crazy. Without Facebook, you're going to be leaving green on the screen. Um, Facebook connected players convert better into paying players, and they spend more money. OK, don't listen to me. Uh, Ooga, they are nine times more likely to spend money than players who don't connect with Facebook. Who could have a better ambassador than that? 
Log with Facebook, three times more likely to return. Remember that one in six, you know, three times more likely to return, seven to more times are likely to spend. Facebook users spend 85% more. Hands up who wants an 85% pay rise. It, it, it kind of sort of sells itself. Why? Well, you know, it's more social. It's much more fun to shoot somebody you know than to shoot somebody you don't know, or to knock somebody off the high school table that you know, your uncle or relative or your coworker. It makes it more social. Facebook is now getting into the, uh, the mobile uh, publishing business. Um, I'm not from the, that team. I'm just a data nerd. I'm not actually sort of part of that. But I can help connect you with people if you come and see me afterwards. And here's a link. It's, I think we're 874 million active mobile users now. We have a great uh, mechanism for distributing our game. So uh, finally, I think we're, we're kind of ahead of time. But how do you find a growth, good growth hacker? You need to go out and, uh, and get yourself a growth hacker for your team. You need to find somebody who loves data and understands it. You've got to love data. You have a passion for it. Curious, even a little naughty experiment. You know, what can I get away with? What would happen if I do this? What happens if I change? Change things, move things around. Measure everything. Somebody leverages opportunities. Whenever something sort of comes on by, you have to sort of jump on it. Moves fast and create scalable solutions. Again, if somebody comes up and says, well, you need to call your customers and email your customers individually, that's not going to work. You need to have uh, solutions at scale. Seize all chance of visibility. And develop a growth culture, bake it in. You, that, that person has to sort of be enthused about sort of what's important and tell people about what matters. Go back to those dashboards we talked about, you know, acquisition, engagement, retention, monetization. If you're working for a small company, everybody in your company should know what those top level metrics are. How much is it costing us to get our user? What is our retention rate? Do any of your developers know how many users have fall through the bucket? If they know, then they can be thinking, well, when I'm developing this feature, what could I do to help get to that aha moment quicker? What could I do to help retain that person? What could I do to help monetize that person? I was keeping them around a little bit longer. Everybody in the company needs to be aware of what the basic metrics are. I used to work for large companies. More people at the company used to know about the share price of the company than worked about what the basics and the mechanics of the company should be. You have to have this culture sort of baked in. And if you think, it's actually, you know, it's a sexist job in the world, according to the, the Harvard uh, Business Review and Forbes magazine. So, you know, these people are hard to get hold of. But the kind of final couple of slides, you know, you're a growth hacker. If you're not breaking down walls, you're doing the wrong thing. You really need to be the Swiss Army penknife. And anybody who tells you that growth hacking is all about unicorns is just talking blue smoke. It's, it's just garbage. You're looking for people with Swiss Army penknives, not the unicorns. And finally, you never outgrow growth. I proudly work at Facebook, and there are 1.2, 1.25 billion users, and I work on Facebook's growth team. So you never outgrow. Thank you very much. I know I talk very, very quickly. I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. I uh, might just be speaking as a uh, sexy, slightly naughty holder of a degree in applied mathematics, but if uh, don't guess test isn't part of your culture right now, you're doing something absolutely wrong. So we've put many, many mobile games into the channels and empirically uh, across the board, kind of what I see is if you require someone to log in to Facebook to play the game, you, you lose 50% of your funnel right there. And if you make a Facebook login optional, it's about a 10% conversion. Now also have seen they do stay longer and pay more um, can act absolutely, you know, back up, back up from my own experience what you were talking about mm -hmm. with uh, Perry and the other quotes. Um, my question to you is, uh, if there were silver bullets for uh, convincing players to to log into Facebook, what would they be? Tough question. Um, it sort of comes down to uh, difference between sort of push and pull. You need to make people want to do it, or that it's a quid pro quo sort of value uh, deal that sort of goes through. Why did people share the Fox video? Why did people share Flappy, Flappy Birds? Whatever it happens to be, they shared it because they wanted to, not because somebody told them to do them. So any application that says, you must do this, you're going to lose people because you know, it has to be they have a desire to do that. And it's the same thing with login. You know, if you do log in, and we'll give you an extra few credits here. Log in and do this. It's a, it's a, it's that, Quid pro quo, it's the value of our position. What you give up, if it's transparent, you give something up and we'll give something in return. And if that value proposition is right, then you're going to go ahead and do it. So don't force people. Make people do it because they want to do it and they get benefit from it. I, we, 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 there's no magic source. It's, it's the idea of, you know, people do it because they want to do it. it. It really comes to that. So gaming is passive entertainment much in the way that Riot 
puts a heavy emphasis not only on is this fun to play, but is this fun to watch. I, 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 I'm not sure I, know, I, I could comment on sort of that. It, fair enough, fair enough. As we know, uh, gaming is a, an, an alternate source of entertainment, as, as, as you was going through. There is only a certain amount of time in people's day, and you come home from work, and you've got, you know, should I watch TV? Should I go to the movies? Should I play a game? Nielsen figures that are sort of showing that the TV viewership is falling off. There's, we don't have more than 24 hours in a day. We still have the fixed time. So people are actually shifting their entertainment from sort of doing that into sort of doing other things. And gaming, there are diff different horses for courses that sort of go through. There is no, I can't tell you to like tomato soup if you don't like tomato soup. Uh, and I can argue all I like if I like vegetable soup that sort of goes through. To you, it's whatever your tastes happen to be. And if you like a game, um, you may like Farmville, the skin box and click on those things. And if you do, that's fine. There's no, there's no such thing about what the definition of a game is or not game. It, it, it really comes down to a fundamental thing that sort of says, is this work? Are you paid to do it? Then it's work. If you're not paid to do it and you choose to do it, it's kind of fun. So doodling, skipping stones across the water, clicking on the Skinner box, or sort of playing a game. If you get fun, uh, entertainment from doing it, I'm not going to judge you. You're having fun, and that's a, a good enough experience. And then if you want to share what you're doing with other people, that's fine with me too. Oh, Nick. I'll like whatever you tell me to like, because you're a really <laughs> smart guy. Any other questions for Nick? Well, do we have any other Facebook employees in the audience? Uh, if you want to stick their hands up. Oh, there we go. If anybody wants to talk about the uh, partnership sort of program, then uh, Bob's there, and he'll quite happily answer any questions related to that. If you want to talk about sort of uh, data and analytics, then I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards as well. Any questions for Nick? Am I missing anybody here? Uh. Congratulations. Is there uh, any material uh, publications we can find after to, to, to go deeper in the subject? This deck will certainly be available. Uh, either you can, you can get it off me now, or it'll be uh, done through the, the Casual Connect. Maybe I'll come back, and, and this was a beginner's guide. I didn't go into it. Anyway. What I actually do for a living uh, at Facebook is I, I, I just dive in numbers and sort of databases. I'd love to go do another version of this that goes sort of deeper and deeper and deeper. So maybe, maybe hopefully at Casual Connect next year, I'll be able to describe a little bit more about it. Um, I'm, I'm not aware. But, um, it's a relatively new thing. I mean, the, the term growth hacker has, has, has been pretty new. And, I don't think there's, a lot, there's no courses on it, um, and it, I don't sort of, it's down to a lot of common sense, uh, and it's down to sort of, you know, what would you do? How do you sort of go about doing these things? And the best thing I can sort of think is try it out. Again, it's the taste of the fish. It's that A-B testing. I think I've got this idea that may, may move the needle on my traffic. Well, I think just try it out, and if it works, do more of that. If it works, do more of it, and if it doesn't work, you've learned one way not to do it. And every game is slightly different, and I can't sort of say this is what you should do, this is what you should do. Again, it's like that. History is written by the victors. Just because Flappy Birds have done what they do, all right, I know there's going to be clones of Flappy Birds that come out, but I'm not going to say, you know, go ahead and make, a, make your game just like Flappy Birds. That's not how you go about doing it. It's more the mindset, not the actual sort of... The, 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 why is a good chef a good chef? He doesn't necessarily follow a recipe. He kind of knows what combination of ingredients sort of come together will, 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 will make a great final product. I think you need to be a chef. You need to think about mixing those ingredients together, not as we're saying, I'm very good at following a blueprint of uh, how to build a, about this, this sponge pudding. It's not what it's about. It's all about you know, thinking like that. And that may be stuff that's probably hard to teach. And that's why you need to look for one of those people who has that rare combination of Sherlock Holmes and sort of a little bit devious and don't, well, if, I, if, I, if I change this when nobody's looking, whatever it happens to be, that, that's the kind of person that you're looking for. And La you'll know it when you see it. I, I don't know how best to describe it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the sexy, naughty, slightly devious Nick Berry from Facebook. Thank you, Nick.